All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today's study is a preprint, a very important study. I really love it. Uh, very quickly, here is the disclaimer. Please make sure that you have read this disclaimer. Stop the video and then read it or read it in the description. So with this, let's start our discussion. I hope everybody is doing well. Also, welcome to all pets and their humans and those humans who do not have pets yet. So here is drbean.com. This is the study that we're going to talk about. This is a preprint. And it says it right here, preprint not certified by peer review. So why I'm saying this is that sometimes folks send me a message that why do you discuss preprints? These preprints have important uh, data in them, and we can review them as peer reviews. So let's look at this data. What they've sa said here, let me go to my illustrations, and then I would show some of the data on the study. So what they're saying here is, and this has, has been a question by many of the cool beans as well, that what is the situation with the vaccine efficacy in risk groups, diabetics, chronic heart disease, kidney diseases, liver disease, immunocompromised, and so on. So this is a preprint that actually shows that data from UK. Beautifully done. The important thing to note here is the following. If you just wanted to take away, hey, what is this? What is the answer? The answer is that after 10 days of two doses, the vaccine efficacy in at-risk groups is similar to the vaccine efficacy in not at risk group. So that is the important thing. The other secondary point is that after the first dose, after one dose, the vaccine efficacy in at risk group is lower than the non at risk group. So that is important to note. Thirdly, the most reduction was found in immunocompromised. And that makes sense that if somebody's immune system is suppressed with drugs or uh, by uh, due to some infection or cancers, then they are immunocompromised. And so their immune system is not going to work as well. So immunocompromised had the least reduction, but even they, after the second dose, were similar to other groups, very close to other groups. Diabetics also had reduction in vaccine efficacy after the first dose, slight reduction after the second dose. And you can actually think of diabetics as somewhat immunocompromised because their immune system cells are not functioning as well because they're not getting energy and ATP. Then third group, chronic heart disease patients, they also had slight reduction in the vaccine efficacy. So let's look at it. What they did was the comparison. So this is a UK study. Here is a summary of this one. The comparison was done with Pfizer-BioNTech and Oxford-AstraZeneca. Com comparison, this is a preprint. It was an attempt to study the vaccine efficacy in at-risk group. Authors said that there are many studies in general population, but there were less studies that were specific for at-risk group and their efficacy. It is funded by Public Health England, so just know the funding. The cohort type for the vaccine cohort was nested test negative case control. So I had done a, vex a study a few weeks ago. I think that caused some people to become very upset, and they are the ones who are running around complaining. That was also a test negative study and I had criticized it for its weakness. This is also a test negative study. However, you would see that the authors have actually uh, compensated for the test negative by only picking up the data from the clinics, not self-reported data, but the data from the clinics where a medical professional had actually looked at the patient, looked at their symptoms, taken their blood pressure, taken their temperature, did a swab on them, maybe did serology as well if the swab came back positive, and, and they went from there. So this plus 
they only looked at those who also had the uh, test results available and linkable to their uh, data records. So they kind of compensated for that weakness of test negative. This is also an observation study looking backwards. What they did was they looked at out of all the vaccinated cohort people, they looked at those who were at risk. And then they looked at those who were at risk or not at risk, but in the same cohort age and sex model, and they were PCR positive or not PCR positive. The study is from 7th December to 30th June 2021, 7th December 2020. Now, what is the summary and interpretation? Summary is the following. Number one, if you see here, high level response in most population. So vaccines caused high level immune system response in most of the population, the at risk population. However, the one that was most affected or was had the least efficacy, that was the immunocompromised. In the immunocompromised people, after one dose, the vaccine efficacy was lower. However, after two doses, there was small, non-significant reduction in the vaccine efficacy. And what was that? Pfizer was 73% effective and AstraZeneca was 74.6% effective. Continuing, how did they do it? So this is the summary, this is it. What they said was, we looked at the patients who are at risk, we looked at their symptomatic positive cases, we looked at their serology, we looked at their swabs, and we have found out that after first dose in some at-risk individuals, vaccine efficacy is less. However, uh, 10 days after the second dose, they're all the same and they're all similarly strong. Still efficacy in hematological disorders patients, they can expect that efficacy to be lower. Now is the detail. So what they did was the, the uh, researchers, they took data from electronic records this was general practice record. So 718 clinics and their data was pulled anonymized. So this was not with the people's information. And they had asked for permission as well to use the data. Seven, about 7 million and more were the total number of people. That was 11% of the GP patients and 10% of the population. What they then did was they also looked at test positive PCR data from the electronic records. So in UK, whenever somebody is getting tested, that test data is sent to a central place where it, it is linked to the patient's record. So they looked at the test data as well for swabs. And in some cases, there was serology as well. The case, the definition of a person who is sick or positive was number one, they are PCR positive. And number two, they had clinical signs and symptoms confirmed by a healthcare professional, not self-reported, within 10 days of becoming PCR positive. So either before or after. A case negative or a control was somebody who was who had the clinical signs and symptoms, but were PCR negative. So this is the two groups that they used. One was control and the other one was supposed to be positive. Now what they did was they took all the individuals in this age group and comorbidity group who were vaccinated. So they were about 7 million. From there, they had certain exclusions. And then the remaining were 5.6 million. From the 5.6 million, they, they took those who were 65 plus. That was 1.276 million or, or 1.2 million. Then from these 1.2 million, 65 years and, and above, they took those who had some comorbidities, at least one comorbidity. And that number was 1.05 million. They, they were able to link about 9,000 test results into people in this group. And that is the cohort than they used. 
Now for serology. The, what they did was they took those patients' data after January 1st, whose serology was available. There were 7,992 records available. In them, they saw those who were vaccinated. And out of those who were vaccinated and their serology was available, there were 3,905. Then out of those 3,905, those that were positive because of the vaccine were 3,592. Now, what does that mean? This is a very, very interesting thing. So I'm going to explain it. Imagine you are a doctor. In your clinic, you receive two patients. They both are SARS-CoV-2 serology positive, antibody positive. How do you tell which one may have been antibody positive because of vaccine versus antibody positive because of infection? That is the basic question they had to answer so they can separate who had the antibodies produced because of vaccine versus because of infection. And they did a very simple thing and that is if somebody has the whole virus, virus has more proteins than the S proteins, correct? So virus has N protein and M protein and so on. So what they did was they looked at those people whose antibodies were positive against SARS-CoV-2, but if they were positive against N protein, then that means this person has developed antibodies because of the infection. Why? Because in a vaccine, there is no N protein given. Vaccine only brings in spike protein. So if somebody is spike protein positive, but N protein negative, then that is a person who has antibodies because of a vaccine. But if somebody has S positive or not, but they also have N positive, then that is they have antibodies because of a natural infection. So this is the assumption that authors used. So with this assumption, then they wanted to figure out who are the people who are positive because of the vaccine. And that is what they measured to see who are the people who are immunocompromised or sorry, at risk patients and antibody positive because of vaccination. That is how they counted. So if I was, let's say, at risk, let's say I'm diabetic, and I go, I have my record, they found my record says Mobin diabetic. I'm not, but I'm just making up this. Mobin diabetic. Then they also have my serology found, and my serology says Mobin is N negative, S positive. That means I was vaccinated and I have S protein antibodies. On the other hand, if I am diabetic, plus I have antibodies positive, but the positive antibodies include N protein antibodies, that means I had antibodies because of an infection. So with this, they further analyzed those who had positive antibodies after the first dose versus after 10 days after the second dose. This is how they collected the data. So now let's look at the data itself. And my apologies, now my mouse is going to make noises. And as Kulbeen say, these noises sound like uh, duck quacking. So <laughs> get ready for the duck quacking. So here, I'm going to go directly to the tables and figures because that is what is more important. So here, this is the table one. Table one is a vaccine efficacy after dose one before dose two in immunocompromised, not immunocompromised, at risk and others. So let's see. Let's read this one. For example, here, age group 18 to 49, no risk, 18 to 49, no comorbidities. They saw that out of 166 people in their record, 159 had S protein present. That means they were vaccinated and they had developed immunogenicity or immune response. That is a 96% response. 
and they used that as one as a reference. They said in healthy individuals, if you give vaccine 266, you can at least find the immune response in 159. And let's call that as a standard. Then they measured at-risk groups against this number. So here, if you see, for example, 50 to 59, again, regardless of their uh, comorbidities, 50 to 59 was 95% and 95% and so on. So once you see how this data is laid out, now let's go to the, to the risk groups. So here is, let's start from the top here, no risk group. So those folks who did not have any risk after the vaccines, 675 people became immune responsive. That means spike protein positive antibody to spike protein, not spike protein positive, but antibody to spike protein. And that was in 97% immune response. So they took that as a reference. Any risk group, general, any risk group, average, all of them together, 91% response. So not bad. But now if we, and shielding are also those who are specifically at risk and who are requested to stay protected. Now let's look at individuals. So for example, chronic heart disease. Those folks who did not have chronic heart disease, they had vaccine response of 94%, meaning when the vaccine was given to 1,201 people, out of them, 1,129 had the immune response. They use that as a reference as one. And then chronic heart disease, yes, those who had the disease, they were 338. When they received the vaccine, 304 developed the response. So this is 90% response compared to 94% standard response. And it's not a bad response. Then if you continue to go diabetes, for example, non-diabetics, 94% developed the response to the vaccine or they developed antibodies to spike protein when they were given vaccine one dose. And the time was, if you see here at the top, the time was 28 plus days after dose one, but before dose two. Diabetics, 88. So not bad. If you see here, neurological uh, issues, 93%. Not bad. Chronic kidney disease, 94%. Morbid obesity, obesity 93%. Chronic respiratory issues, 95%. Immunocompromised, not immunocompromised, 95%. Immunocompromised, 70%. So that is the reduction that out of 132 people who were immunocompromised when they received the vaccine after the first dose, only 93 of them developed significant or reasonable immune response. Others did not. So this is what they said throughout their paper that immunocompromised after the first dose did not develop enough number of people did not develop good response. The majority did develop it, but still there is only 70% who developed it. 30% did not develop a good response. Chronic liver disease. So this is a question that has been asked many times. So here, thanks to this study authors, there is the answer here. Chronic liver disease, 91%. So out of 74 patients who had chronic liver disease, and were given vaccine, and that was the first dose, and that was before the second dose, 67 out of 74 developed a response. Now, here is more important one, and this is the 10 days after second dose. Let's call it full vaccination, full protection, if you will. Whatever full protection a vaccine can offer, that is the assumption here. So now let's see what is that protection here. So if you see here, for example, the first line, first row, 18 to 49, there were 39 people. 
out of them, 38 had positive spike proteins, antibodies in them. So that was a 97% response, or out of 197 people developed the response, and three still did not, or did not develop reasonable enough response. They used this as a reference value of one. Now 50 to 59, 31 to 31, 100% response and so on. What I wanna see once again is the at-risk group. It is interesting to see this table, for example, AstraZeneca, second dose, 10 days after the second dose, 101 and 100% efficacy. Or oh, sorry, 101 was the total number of people who received it, 100 people, had developed the response. This is regardless of their at-risk state or not. So 99%. Pfizer-BioNTech, 98%. Unknown, 100%. Let's look at, this is also here, this was. This is also interesting, standard two to five, the schedule between the two doses. Two to five weeks between the two doses, 98%. Six to nine weeks between the two doses, 98%. 10 plus weeks, between the two doses, 100%. Now let's look at the risk groups of 10 days after the second dose. So here, let's start from diabetes. Chronic heart disease is first. So chronic heart disease, those who did not have it, they responded 99%. And those who had chronic heart disease, after the second dose, we're talking 98%. So generally here, you would see that the vaccine efficacy reduction is less. It's not really the vaccine efficacy reduction. It is more of a vaccine immunogenicity production percentage. So it is not that it is 97% efficacy. It is that out of 100 people, for example, here, out of 119 patients of chronic heart disease who were vaccinated, second dose, 10 days after, 117 of them had antibodies. So that is 98% of them had it. So 2% did not respond with reasonable amount of antibodies. And remember, we have done this discussion before as well. In some people, it is actually possible that the T helper one pathway is engaged more and their antibody production levels are just not high in general. Here we are looking at only the antibodies, not T cells, not cytotoxic T cells, not innate arm. So just the antibodies. Diabetics. Those who are not diabetic, they responded 99% of them. Diabetics responded 99% as well. So after second dose, you're seeing that they're almost the same, even with the risk present. Neurological, 99%. Neurological symptoms, yes. Or patients of neurological issues, 98%. Chronic kidney disease, 99% to 100%. So chronic kidney disease patients who are given the vaccines, second dose plus 10 days after, all of them had the response. Good job. Morbid obesity, not morbid, morbid obesity, 99% had the response. With morbid obesity, after second dose plus 10 days, 100% had the response. Chronic, chronic respiratory disease not present, 99%, present 96% of them developed the response. The, the, here you see a reduction. Immunocompromised, 99, 97. So here you see some reduction as well. Chronic liver disease, 99%, and then those who had the chronic liver disease and were given the vaccine, and it was second dose plus 10 days, 100%. 14, although these cohort sizes are small, 14 to 14 is a small number, but still, this is the comparison. They, they have this very, very interesting um, set of data here that I would love to read it to you, but I'm gonna uh, go on. I wanna quickly show a couple of more things here. This is a, let me see if I can make it bigger. What I would like to show you is the following. So <clears throat> look at this one, immunocompromised patients. 
after first dose, the efficacy was, you know, the general efficacy, the efficacy that we talk about vaccine efficacy, the, one, the tables above we saw were percentages. This is efficacy, 4% efficacy in immunocompromised after first dose, before second dose. But after the second dose, 74% efficacy. So that is pretty good. And the least efficacy they observed was in the hematological disorders, which makes sense that somebody with the blood disorder may have blood cell production issues or abnormal blood cell production or one type of cells becoming more than others and so on. So it is possible they may have immune cell production issues too. So this is 74.1% after the second dose, 10 days plus. If you look at other uh, comorbidities, you would actually see that they, after the first dose or the second dose, they had comparable results. So let's see for a second. Let's go here, all ages 16 to 64. Dose one efficacy, 54%. And they have, this is the, I'm struggling with the, uh, type. So this is the average vaccine efficacy. That means all vaccines. So dose one, for example, 16 to 64, 54%. Dose two, 84.3%. That is the efficacy. And then you can actually look at the remaining numbers here. They're all for various risk factors. And these efficacies are fine. What is this? 679, for example that is slightly lower than others, and it is non-risk age groups. So if I look at this one, chronic heart disease, for example. Chronic heart disease, first dose, 51% efficacy. Second dose, 87%. Then diabetes, 44% after first dose, 81.8% after the second dose, and so on. So not a huge issue, and I would request you to look at this table by yourself as well. Now I want to show you one more. A graph which makes it even more clear. I hope you're hearing the, <laughs> the duck quacking sound. So this is dose one, 28 to 90 days after dose one, or you can say before the dose two. These three lines here, black is all vaccines. I believe red is AstraZeneca and blue is Pfizer. And if you see this dotted line in the center, that is the unity line. If any efficacy crosses that from left to right or right to left, that result is not significant. So here, if you see after dose one, they're all significant except here, if you see this is in immunocompromised. That is a discussion we just did, that in immunocompromised after the dose one, the vaccine efficacy is not tremendously great. And so if you see here, AstraZeneca had lesser, all average was fine, and then not fine, meaning more, and Pfizer had better response than AstraZeneca. Chronic liver disease, also, if you see, there is a unity cross here, and in there, Pfizer did less better compared to AstraZeneca. And this one here, morbid obesity, also had Pfizer crossing over from unity, but this is after dose one. What is my takeaway from this? After dose one, if somebody has morbid obesity or chronic um, liver disease or immunocompromised, they should stay a little more careful. Authors have also done one more discussion and that is, they said, do you think this, that then a patient, let's say immunocompromised, should accelerate their second dose? So instead of wait, waiting 90 days, maybe do it faster. And they said, we think it will be counterproductive. Now, is that because they were sponsored by Public Health England or that is their thought? But I would read it out to you. What do you think? Should this be accelerated? My first thought was it should be accelerated, but they said it would be counterproductive. So let's see that in a second as well. I want to see the second table. This is 14 plus days after the second dose, 14 plus days. And here, if you see the dotted line is here and all vaccine efficacies are on the right side of it. None of them is crossing the unity. That means they're all doing fine. 
So for example, chronic liver disease, AstraZeneca is doing fine, although the, the range of the confidence interval is large. The Pfizer is doing fine. Overall, the result is fine. Immunocompromised are doing fine and so on. So this was interesting for me as well to read. And now in the discussion, um, I want to read that part where they said it's not useful to uh, change the vaccine interval. So our findings would support maximizing coverage with two doses of vaccine among immunocompromised groups. In the context of high rates of COVID-19 in the population, there may be a case for redu reducing the interval between doses in order to maximize coverage. However, other studies have suggested that longer dosing intervals result in improved immune response. Therefore, such a move may be counterproductive. So they said may be counterproductive. In particular, in the context of low COVID-19 activity, a finding that we also see in our serology data, these findings are based on medically attended symptomatic disease. Protection against severe disease after one dose, including hospitalization and death, may be greater. They don't actually have that data. So they're saying maybe protection against severe disease is greater. So this is their point of view on the second dose. Again, this is still to be peer reviewed. So if you have an opinion or you have a criticism of the study, please uh, put that out. They are waiting for the peer reviews. The study has a number of strengths. We rely on, so this is important. Compare that to the other studies that I did a few weeks ago. We rely on cases attending general practice and having relevant symptoms recorded by a medical practitioner which is likely to be more reliable than self-reporting. They are aware of it, self-reporting. We also have a large amount of data on previous medical history and demographic characteristics from the full clinical record, which allows us to adjust for a large number of possible confounders. Furthermore, we, we have both immunogenicity data and vaccine effectiveness data. So they have a lot of data and that compensates for the weakness. And then they said we have limitations as well and I would, have you read it instead of me going through this. Then they have some more um, data over here as well. This is the study. The takeaway from the study is this is a question that has been very, very common. And that is that if we are at risk, will vaccine be protective enough or not? And so here you're seeing that vaccine after the full protection, efficacy is much better almost comparable to not at, at risk groups. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for watching as well. Please like, subscribe, and share. If you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. One is to buy me a coffee. The other one is to use PayPal to support it. And third one is to be a patron. I would see you in a few minutes in a chit chat. Thank you very much.